Hi, I'm Dave Falvey. I'm the, your host of Rich and Famous Bankruptcies. And today, our featured uh, contestant is going to be John Conley. John Conley is certainly an Irish name. You might think of John Conley, an Irish author, who wrote about a former police officer who became a detective hunting for the killers of his wife and daughter. You might think of His Excellency, John Conley, the second bishop of New York, from 1814 to 1825. Or you might think of John Conley, the FBI agent, who was in prison for racketeering and obstruction of justice charges stemming from his relationship with the Winter Hill Gang and James Whitey Bulger. But we're going to be talking about the John Conley who was a passenger in the car in which President Kennedy was assassinated. Our John Conley was the 39th governor of Texas and was Secretary of the Navy under President Kennedy, Secretary of the Treasury under Nixon, and in 1973 he switched parties and became a Republican and unsuccessfully ran for the Republican nomination for president in 1980. John Conley Jr. was born February 27, 1917, in Floresville, Texas. His father was John Conley, Sr., and he stood 6 feet 5 inches, and his mother was Leela Wright. And their original homestead still stands to this day. John Conley Jr., as a young man, was the spitting image of his father, John Conley Sr. My primary source for this presentation is James Reston's book, The Lone Star, The Life of John Conley, 691 pages. John Conley always had a commanding presence and was over six feet tall and went to the University of Texas where he was elected student body president. He earned an undergraduate degree and law degree from the University of Texas, and it was at the University of Texas that he developed an interest in politics and public speaking. At the University of Texas is where he also met Ida Nell Brill, affectionately called Nellie, who became his wife and they had four children. After graduation, John Conley was drawn to politics and to Washington, D.C., where he became secretary to Lyndon Baines Johnson. Many people saw in Conley a younger version of LBJ. And here's John Conley and LBJ at the 1956 Democratic Convention. During World War II, while both Conley and Johnson were enlisted in the Navy, their wives were in Washington, D.C., holding down Lyndon's congressional seat. Lyndon Johnson had married Claudia Taylor, a.k.a. Lady Bird Johnson. Here's Lady Bird Taylor at age three. She was raised in what was called the Brick House in Karnak, Texas and her father was Thomas Jefferson Taylor, who became a wealthy businessman. Now, LBJ and Lady Bird had two children, Linda Baines Johnson and Lucy Baines Johnson. Therefore, there were four LBJs in the Johnson household. Papa LBJ, Linda Baines Johnson, Mama LBJ, Lady Bird Johnson, Child 1, LBJ, Linda Baines Johnson, and Child 2, LBJ, Lucy Baines Johnson. When Lady Bird married Lyndon, she had an inheritance, part of which she used to fund Lyndon's bid for a congressional seat, which he won. Lady Bird Johnson also used part of her inheritance in 1943 to buy a radio station, KTBC, and eventually KBTC became an affiliate of CBS Radio. And eventually Lady Bird Johnson sold 
KTBC for $100 million. Today, it is owned by Fox Broadcasting. And this was the basis for the Johnson fortune. Lyndon Johnson always protested that Lady Bird bought the station on her own and that he applied no political pressure to help her. The foremost biography of Lyndon Johnson is Robert Caro. Robert Caro has spent the last 14 years researching Lyndon Johnson. He has written the following. The Path to Power, The Years of Lyndon Johnson, Volume 1. Means of Ascent, Volume 2. Master of the Senate, Volume 3. The Passage of Power, The Years of Lyndon Johnson, Volume 4. In his second book, The Years of Lyndon Johnson, Means of Ascent, Robert Carroll examined the roots of the Johnson broadcasting fortune and conclusively proves that Johnson completely lied when he said he didn't use political pressure to make his fortune. Robert Carroll revealed for the first time that Life magazine was going to conduct a major investigation into the fortune of LBJ when he was vice president. But this decision was discussed in the Life office of New York uh, on November 22, 1963, the day President Kennedy was assassinated. LBJ and Lind Lady Bird were, are reputed to have made over $100 million on their radio and television empire. Johnson used his political ability and power to amass a fortune, but as fate would have it, the investigation of Life magazine was canceled. And one of the greatest comments ever about amassing a fortune was given to us by Honoré de Balzac, a French novelist and playwright, who wrote and said, Behind all great wealth is a great crime. It could be said by Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall that Johnson used honest political graft to make his fortune. And he dodged a major bullet because the unfortunate assassination of President Kennedy resulted in, fortunately for Johnson, the cancellation of a major investigation into his finances. Now, why have I digressed about LBJ when our topic is John Conley? John Conley was the protege to LBJ. He was his secretary during his congressional years. Here's Conley and LBJ at the LBJ ranch with Hubert Humphrey, and LBJ. John Conley had supported LBJ at the Democratic National Convention against John Kennedy. John Conley's fortunes were intimately entwined with LBJ's political successes. But there's quite a contrast between the master LBJ and John Conley. What's the takeaway? Johnson didn't go into business as a businessman but used his political talents and connections to make a fortune. And some uh, cynics would paraphrase Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall by saying, behind Johnson's $100 million fortune was honest political graft, and he got away with it. John Conley had considerable political talents and would have been voted most likely to succeed when he was voted president of the student body. He had been in politics all of his life and after retiring from politics went into business. But he had never run, for a, biz run a business before but he just plunged into the business of being a real estate construction and speculator. What was the cause for the public humiliation and divestiture of John Conley? Most people who file for bankruptcy don't have personal property which exceeds their bankruptcy exemption for personal furniture and household goods. Under the federal scheme for exemptions, a person has $12,250 as an exemption in personal household property, and a couple has a total of $24,500 as an exemption in household property. It doubles. 
But under Connecticut's exemption for household goods, there's no limit on the exemption. In Texas, which has a very liberal exemption scheme and one of the best in the nation, a family has a personal property exemption of $60,000. From what I can gather about the Conley bankruptcy, their personal household property had substantial value and more value than the allowed exemption, and therefore there was a public auction of their personal property. And this is what triggered the public auction of that property. Here's John Conley and Nellie Conley standing in the auction room viewing all of their personal property which is going to be publicly auctioned. And here he is in the audience attending the auction of all his worldly goods looking for lawn. During the boom times, Texas banks were loaded awash with petrodollars. But then came the crash and the boom times ended. The bubble burst and the economy tanked. And all the multi-million dollar construction projects of Barnes and Conley were called due and they wouldn't sell. And John Conley had personally guaranteed all the loans. James Reston said, though, that it was, it was hubris or pride that precedes the fall and caused Conley to fail because even though the Conleys were very well off, they weren't Texas rich. And John Conley wanted to be Texas rich. John Conley had done it all. Secretary of the Navy, 1961. Governor of Texas, 1963 to 1969. Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, 1971. Presidential candidate, 1980. But John Conley ran in the 1980 Republican primary against a man who is to become the most popular president since FDR, namely Ronald Reagan. Conley's political career was over once he lost his bid for the presidency. But at age 63, Conley was not about to be put out to pasture. He had too much life and energy left in him to retire. He could have retired to a very comfortable life, but he wasn't ready to smell the roses because there was more he wanted out of life and himself. He embarked on what was to be his last career, namely that of real estate entrepreneur. James Reston's uh, author of the biography of John Conley was interviewed by Brian Lamb uh, regarding what motivated John Conley to go into business. Let's listen to part of that interview. Page <clears throat> 117. Um, and I guess the reason why this was interesting uh, was based on the period that this was said by John Conley which I think was around 1946 or 48 around there, and you can tell us in just a second, <clears throat> compared to, again, the last couple of years what we've, what's been going on in this town. John Conley supposedly, I think, says this to Lyndon Johnson, maybe, yeah, to Lyndon Johnson, his friend. Quote, Congressman, I have just become convinced in my own mind that more than ever before, everyone is money mad. The whole approach to everything is extremely selfish and greedy. I believe that to be true. Assuming it, 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 it to be true, that fact alone is your greatest weakness. It is not only your greatest weakness, but the greatest weakness of our government. When was that said, and was that John, am I right here in putting that in context? That's a letter that I found in the LBJ library. It's very revealing, isn't it? It's, it's a, really a watershed moment for for John Conley in his political life and in his ethical life, I think, where he, um, where he understands the connection between politics and money and has to decide whether he is um, uh, going to fall in with the way in which money is illegally and unethically used in politics or whether he's going to reject it. And, um, well, I think the truth is he didn't reject it. He accepted that that was the way it was because he certainly in later life, uh, you know, lived within that system. 
and, and that was in what, 1946 or 48? That's right. <clears throat> um, I have I have become convinced in my own mind that more than ever before, everyone is money mad. Now, yeah. what happened in the last 40 years in this country? Yes, and what happened to John Connolly at the end of his life? That's precisely what happened to him. He became money mad. You know, he he had. Um, been in and out of politics and government all his life, and uh, he lost, he really was humiliated in uh, the presidential election in 1980, or the presidential primaries by Ronald Reagan. He was, became an all, real also ran, and he said, that's it. I mean, my political career is over, but I'm still reasonably young, and I've got a lot of energy, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to become Texas rich. And he just gave himself over to, uh, to making millions upon millions of dollars. So he could, it's almost a sort of a, uh, an impulse to become um, on the same level with all those moneyed people like Sid Richardson that he'd known all his life, but he'd never really quite been as rich as they had. It yes, I have said before that John Conley wanted to be not just rich, but Texas rich. And having gone as far as he could in politics and having his health and energy and vast social contacts, he probably knew that if he became Texas rich, he could once again walk in the halls of power. But also, there was a miscalculation on his part. And yes, pride can make you think something is easy and not very complicated or difficult once you've been, around, been governor of a state bigger than France, secretary of the U.S. Treasury, confidant of the most wealthy Texans, that amassing a fortune could easily be accomplished. He rubbed elbows with Rockefeller and all the super wealthy of the world. You can see him here in this photo standing next to Nelson Rockefeller, Ford, and Reagan. However, the Texas economy did crash due to the fact that the price of oil plunged and banks, which were once swimming in petrodollars, started calling their loans and withdrew their lines of credit. So the Conley Barnes real estate empire crashed. And since Conley had personally signed on millions of dollars worth of loans, his creditors started to circle the wagon. One way of viewing Conley's bankruptcy would be that of a financial calamity was visited upon him. Or you could say he didn't have experience in real estate development and should never have entered into business in the manner in which he did. This reminds me of some of the bankruptcy cases which I have handled where the person was very intelligent engineer but felt bored or trapped in his job and wanted to do more and be independent and be their own boss. They listened to too many programs and books which promised instant wealth in real estate by flipping houses. But they failed first to go to work for someone who flips houses or who runs a restaurant and learn the business. Essentially, they failed to be a devil's advocate in their research and planning. John Conley's foray into real estate speculation was far larger than flipping houses, but the principle was the same. He was flipping large real estate developments. In my opinion, it was the same as the person who believes in all the television commercials about flipping houses, but on a far bigger scale. It's called Flip and Grow Rich. I've seen many people who thought that it could win in the flip and grow rich real estate game. And my advice is that very few people get rich by flipping houses. There's a high percentage of new businesses that fail, always. But here's a quick tip. Say, to, say you are thinking of going into business, and let's say you are thinking of buying a franchise. Go to Google and type in the name of the franchise, and after the name, type complaints by franchisees, or lawsuits by franchisees, or arbitrations by franchisees. 
and you will be amazed at the results. Contact former franchisees and or attorneys who sue franchisor. Search under Suing Franchisors. And here's another tip. Retain an attorney who sued franchisors and ask him or her about franchises in general and ask for a review of your franchise contract. I have spoken to one attorney who limits his practice to franchise law. You can find his website at LegalFranchise.com and his name is Mitchell Kassoff and he's in New Jersey and at the risk of being self-serving I would highly recommend that in your devil's advocate role you consult with a bankruptcy attorney and ask what are the pitfalls of going into business? Most people who go into business are overly optimistic that they will be successful and I have never in my career had anyone come to my office who is planning to go into business and plan for a bankruptcy. And that's because they weren't looking at risk and managing risk. Major Fortune 500 companies have st strategic long-term asset planning committees. And on those committees they have hired retired bankruptcy judges as paid consultants. The United States has war games in order to prepare for disasters, but the small business person doesn't think about this downside to a business. For example, when Union Carbide had one of the world's largest industrial accidents and thousands of people were killed, the legal structure and organization of Union Carbide became of critical importance. By having a legal structure like the cells of a beehive, one cell or unit could be closed down without damaging the rest of the structure. Union Carbide, like all other major companies, had prepared for a crisis. And I want to note that people in India were outraged with Union Carbide and charged Warren Anderson, CEO, with homicide. Let me give you an example of a case where disaster planning was neglected. A lady was seriously injured on a ferry boat. The ferry company had two ferry boats, both owned by the same corporation. Therefore, both boats could be attached. But if each boat was in the name of a separate corporation, only one boat could have been attached. Asset planning would have reduced the risk by 50%. Just as an aside, you really need an LLC or corporation when you have assets to protect. So many times people are amazed when they file for bankruptcy protection that their LLC doesn't afford them any protection. That's because in 99.99% .99 of the cases when they obtain a loan, the bank always insists that they sign as a guarantor. This is called a recourse loan. And because the bank has recourse against you, the owner of the business, they can go after you. I'm not saying not to have an LLC or an incorporation, but to realize there are many situations where it doesn't shield you from any liability or risk. What did John Conley have to say the day of his bankruptcy when his personal property was being publicly auctioned. Quote, Our perspective changed for all time on November 22nd, 1963, Kennedy's assassination. When you come that close to your hereafter, I assure you, you think about what's important in life. What's important are your family, your friends, your children, and grandchildren, and your maker, not material things. Money has never been an idol of mine. I've never devoted my life to making money, never will. The accumulation of wealth is not necessarily a measure of success. I know people with a lot of money. Some in, have inherited it, some got it by good luck, Many of them I don't have any respect for 
at all. Because I don't think they've done anything with themselves or with their talents. And I know a lot of people who don't have any money who I greatly admire. They use their hearts, their minds, and their God-given talents to the maximum they can. I think that summarizes it, that after his bankruptcy, John Conley and his wife Nellie continued in a very positive lifestyle. I'm Dave Falvey, and remember, success is getting up one more time. Money.